this episode in this episode uh, <laughs> blooper it took us less time than it took England to score against Italy oh <laughs> oh man life math a podcast undescribably tangled unnecessarily complex so bad that it's good Life math. I just want to say this feels very weird. We haven't done an episode in in a while, and um, just back in the game, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, back in the game. Okay, so this is the the football episode, and by football, I mean the greatest game in the world, not American football, but football. It is the game where people. Hit not American football, but football. It is the game where people hit the ball with their feet. Right? <laughs> yeah, or because I was doing some research before the episode, and as Wikipedia calls it, it is not football, it is either soccer, okay, or association football, which I had never heard as a phrase before. So apparently the correct term is association football. Awful, awful. This is an awful start. To what, what we're going to be talking about. Both of us know absolutely nothing about football. Well, we've both played football. We've played much more FIFA, the <laughs> the PC game or PlayStation game, um, than we have played actual football. To exemplify this, <laughs> I it's good. Now, I'm going to ask you five questions. Five questions about football, which... You need to answer to the best of your knowledge. Depends, <laughs> right? Depends, depends. Yeah, okay, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> but um, the first one is, it's an easy one. We're starting, <laughs> I'm starting easy. So, you know what's a penalty, right? Yeah. Okay, can you please give some background for our listeners? Well, so a penalty is when there's a, a fall in, in the, the box, so like right in front of the goalkeeper. And the attacker was faulted, so the defenders just kicked him, the attacker fell, and then it's just like a, a static situation where the ball is placed 11 meters, is it? I don't know, 11 meters away from the goal, and it's just 1v1, one attacker versus the goalie. Great start. It's a de- in, in depth knowledge right here. Hit the ball when you have a penalty kick, and your answer was 11 meters. Congratulations, most football fans will say this is the correct answer. However, technically, <laughs> it is 10.97 meters <laughs> or 36 feet. Sorry. Wow. Sorry. I can't believe football is defined in Imperial units. This is actually very erotic. It is, it is a British game, they say. Well, according to the final yesterday, not really. <laughs> It's an Italian game, or as we call it here, calcio. <laughs> uh, indeed, indeed. Now, how about the football <laughs> pitch size? How big is the pitch where they play? Wow, I have no idea. Um, okay, okay. So forty meters by one hundred and twenty meters. Let's let's call it that. I have no idea. This answer was quite alright. <laughs> Actually, I had to Google this the football <laughs> pitch size. How big is the pitch where they play? Wow, I have no idea. Um, okay. Okay, so 40 meters by 120 meters. Let's let's call it that. I have no idea. This answer was quite all right. <laughs> Actually, I had to Google this. However, apparently, uh, football pitch sizes vary, but most of the times, they try to make it <laughs> 100 meters by 60 meters, while... On average, <laughs> uh, 105 meters by 68 meters. Uh, are you having fun? How, how are you finding the questions? <laughs> Ask me anything football and I'll tell you anything because obviously the answers don't matter. Like any size is fine. <laughs> it's still a football pitch. Now, the next question. Who won the FIFA World Cup in 2018? This is the last World Cup. Oh my God. Mbappe carrying them forward. Wow. 
incredible. I, I'm a football man, you know. <laughs> I just, I, I just, you know, in the evening I go to bed. I'm like, oh, should I read the book or no? I'm gonna, I'm gonna catch up on my football. Without... So the next question. So the... far, I'm crushing it. By the way, I'm getting this job. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Is my job football? <laughs> I'll, I'll be doing football. <laughs> All right, let's do it. I'm gonna give you five football players, and you have to guess their country, their current football club, and their age. Are you ready? Wow, yeah, okay. Lionel Messi. Okay, Argentina, Barcelona, 33. Wow, you were so close, but you got only one correct. He's from Argentina, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Technically, he used to be even from Barcelona. Right now, he apparently is a free agent and he's, he hasn't signed with Barcelona. And he's, he hasn't signed with Barcelona. And uh, you can basically... <laughs> you can employ Messi for free, basically. You have for, to pay him, free. but you don't have to buy him. <laughs> but it's for free. Yeah, it's, he's a free agent. Probably he's going to sign with Barcelona again. But for the time being, he's not a part of Barcelona. So sorry. I, I, I can't believe you started with a trick question. With like my <laughs> absolute zero prior knowledge. And you started with a trick question. <laughs> Oh, no, man. It's not a trick question. It just shows um, that you haven't checked the news. And his age, you were almost correct. 34 years old now. Next one. <laughs> CR7, Cristiano Ronaldo. Country, club, and age. Go. Portugal, Juventus, 32. Wow. Two out of three correct once again. He's oh, from Portugal, indeed. indeed. He's playing for Juventus. And uh, he's actually 36 years old. Now, on to the more complicated ones. These were the easy ones. Uh, Kevin De Bruyne. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Country club <laughs> and age. To, to, to all of the non-football <laughs> listeners, like, what? You, you know exactly as much as me right now. Kevin De Bruyne, <laughs> De Bruyne, De Bruyne, De Bruyne, De Bruyne. Okay, I'm going to say he's Dutch. It just sounds Dutch. Half a point. He's from Belgium. <laughs> that was my, oh my, that was literally my other choice. Okay. Okay, cool. So he's Belgian. I don't, I don't know who he plays for. That's literally, a, okay, I'm going to toss a coin and just say like uh, Arsenal. Yeah, sure, Arsenal. A third of a point. Manchester City. <laughs> okay, that was not a point. Manchester City. <laughs> okay, that was not too bad, actually. Like, 28. Good guess. He's 30 years old. Next one. Are you ready for the next question? Never be ready. Poor Pogba. Okay, so Pogba plays for Manchester United. Whoa, amazing. Does he? Yes, he does. <laughs> He was one of the most expensive players. He's from Cote d'Ivoire. Wow. <laughs> that was Didier Drogba, not Paul Pogba. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's okay. I'll give you a quarter of a point <laughs> for this one. He's actually from France. Ah, he's French, okay. And finally, how old is he? Oh my God, he's totally 37. He's totally 28, man. The, 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 <laughs> the average no. age. You should have guessed uh. this. Okay, man. One last one. I know that you're struggling, so I'm going to give you Jurgen Klopp. He's a coach. That's another question. Yes, he's a coach. Good job. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Think. He's, he's a coach. Well. So so I can I can start on Monday, the football job. <laughs> Yeah, but you still haven't answered. Country, club, and age. Jürgen Klopp. Okay, wait. Jürgen Klopp. Dutch. Super Dutch. No. He's so Dutch that he's actually from Germany. Not any no. Germany, but West Germany. See, it's kind of Dutch, you know. It's, that, that's got to be like a third of a point. Oh. <laughs> no. no. Sorry to no. all of our German it's listeners. It's a minus point. <laughs> Okay, so he's German. He was a club. Oh man, Jurgen Klopp. Club. Wait, wait. Jurgen Jurgen Club. 
I have no idea. Leicester City. He's the coach of Liverpool. Liverpool, man. Liverpool. Oh, boo. Boo. If I've learned anything about football. Finally, his age. Like 45. Good medium. 54. Half a point, half a point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Digits commute. Yes. Oh, okay, man. Oh, I see that this is draining for you. So I'm going to ask you the final question before we start the actual podcast. Who is your favorite football player? Ah, that's actually amazing because like you, you <laughs> told me some names before. So I have a collection to pick from. Because if you just ask me who's my favorite, I don't know how many I can actually list realistically. Like a couple. <laughs> okay, who's my favorite? Well, after after the final now, because that's probably half of the games I've ever watched this one game. I, I really cheered for this guy on the Italian team, Chiesa, who apparently is the son of another famous footballer. Also called Chiesa. He inherited the name. This is quite special. <laughs> it's an inspirational story of two Chiesi. <laughs> <laughs> inspirational story of two Chiesi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, right. All right. So this is quite good. This is quite good. I, ex- I actually expected you to bump all of the questions, but you did quite well. And I congratulate you on this. Which, by the way, what it shows is that it's kind of a, a point on football's popularity, at least I don't know, across Europe, that um, I haven't tried to go out of my way in any way to learn anything about football. Yet I knew like people, teams, coaches, like these names are just, you know, in the air around. So it's a, it's a plus for football's popularity. Indeed. Now that we've established that we know something about something, but not really, Uh, we can start talking about football. Football is arguably the best game ever. Actually, just before the podcast, we were discussing different criteria that we can use to evaluate whether football is the greatest game or some other game is the greatest game. It was you that pointed out some data on the topic, so... What do you think? Some preliminary research showed that in terms of estimated number of fans worldwide, football is the number one sport. Um, And then also the other metric that I I used was the revenue, the global revenue of all the individual leagues, which sport. And it seems that football, again, is crushing all other sports. But it could be just because it's very widespread across many countries. Unlike, for example, American football, which is very localized. Basketball is quite localized, professional basketball. Whereas football is just everywhere. So it helps it kind of increase the, re- increase the revenue. But still, even then, there were statistics like revenue per team. And they're very high. Which means that, yeah, there's a lot of money because there's a lot of viewers um, which was backed by the other statistic that they just have the most viewers. Three billion estimated people watch football, which is a lot of people. And the next comp- uh, the next was about two billion, I think. And it was cricket, which came to a pre- as a pretty big surprise for me. But apparently cricket is very popular. Well, cricket is quite popular in India and it's a qu- very big country. So I guess that drives the numbers up. Yeah. Um, well, now that we've established that football is the greatest game, <laughs> <laughs> that was off uh, now. Um, I really want to get into the um, <clears throat> actual topic, right? So why is this? There are many sports. There are sports that are more beautiful. There are sports that are actual topic, right? So why is this? There are many sports. There are sports that are more beautiful. There are sports that are uh, more affordable. There are sports that are more fun to watch but for some reason football has established itself as the greatest game you know they they call it like this all the time now i myself don't watch football that much so i try to think about it from an economics perspective much more however once again there's a framework that i've prepared for you and it is nature versus nurture of sports what, what do I mean by this? Nature in sports is things like physics. Now, let's start from physics. If you have the game of football, 
there is some physics involved in the game. So there is gravity, for instance. So the ball is always on the ground, unlike basketball, baseball, where the ball is all, always flying. There is no physics there. <laughs> no physics, no gravity. <laughs> no, no. no, I mean, from a physics perspective, the nature of football is quite appealing because you don't have to make much effort. You have to make less effort, actually, than in basketball and volleyball because there you have to keep the ball bouncing or keep the ball high up, which makes it much easier. It's like a dimensionality thing. So like in those flying sports like basketball, volleyball, uh, the ball is mostly moving in a 3D space, so it's very hard to um, do stuff with it. Whereas in football, it's for the most part moving in a two-dimensional field, just the actual field you're playing on, right? So it's, a, it's just one dimension less. Imagine you couldn't like do shots that are not on the grass. It would be a fully two-dimensional game. Wow. Well, this is this is quite true, and actually, that's why all the uh, when you cross the ball and you enter the third dimension, these balls are much harder to estimate and to play with. It's a whole new dimension. Which means if you pass the ball on the ground as much as possible and you play the tiki taka of Barcelona, it's going to be much easier for you because you're removing the third dimension from your game. Nice, nice, good observation. Now. This thing led me to the whole barriers to entry issue with basketball. I'm a bit less than 180 uh, meters tall and I will never be a basketball player. You know, I was born to not be a basketball player and almost the same goes for volleyball, but I could be a relatively average to tall football player, right? And that wouldn't be an issue for me. So I think that's another one from a physics perspective, let's say. And that wouldn't be an issue for me. So I think that's another one from a physics perspective, let's say. The nature of football is such that the players do not need to be very tall or very short to be good at the game. Or So you don't need physically to be in any way uh, very tall or very short or anything? Or, you know, very large, like sumo, you need to be a large person, right? So there's no such requirements. But also on the same topic, there's almost no requirements for like uh, like objects that you need. Right? Like tennis, you need this whole thing with the field needs to be perfect and uh, the rackets and stringing the rackets and balls and you open a new one quite often, like a new canister, etc. Whereas with football, even if you don't have a pitch, you just need like, Two rocks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've played football in, in the neighborhood when we were kids with like uh, virtually anything, an apple fell off a tree. Oh, let's kick it around. Indeed. Actually, I call this the tech of the game. You don't need any tech to, to start playing the game. So it's much easier to develop the game for starters. It's very easy to build the pitch, as you say. You just need two, two backpacks after school. You just place them and you can play play football. Almost any other sport requires such complicated tech, man. It's like a bas- basketball. You need you need this this whole hoop, and who's gonna place the hoop when when you're like a child? Or volleyball, you need a net. Tennis, same net. <laughs> Cricket, you need the the thingy, <laughs> you know, the the bat. the bat. I don't know if it's called a bat actually, but let's just call it a bat. <laughs> So yeah, so the tech is quite good, quite affordable, quite easy to, to build. I guess also what makes it great, actually, you can simplify the game like, like an onion, just peel shells and it still makes sense and it's fun. What I mean is at the very core, it's just, you know, like two kids and a ball and they can kick it around and we still call it football. It's nothing to do with the actual game. There's no strategy, there's no team, there's no goals, but we still call it football, right? So it's just... And it's very core, it's just two kids kicking an apple around the, or, or, or a rock uh, around. And then you can start adding rules like, okay, well, now we can we can add like between those two trees, it's a, it's a goal and you have to score through it and the game makes sense. And then, oh, we're going to ask our couple of friends to play with us and then it's 3v3. Still makes sense. Oh, we're going to make it the field a bit bigger. Um, 
and make it 11 versus 11 still makes sense. Oh, we're also going to add all of those rules like um, a throw in, like penalties and offside. And it still makes sense, right? So sort of means that it still makes sense, right? So sort of means that it, in the end, it's a game with like some set of rules, but removing them doesn't make it any less valid to have fun with, which is important because I don't know, I'll have to think about this for a second, but I'm sure that if in, yeah, for example, you know, tennis, take tennis. If you remove the requirement that you need this very level field, like some very flat pitch to play on, it's impossible because you have to bounce the ball and it bounces wherever it wants. Or if you remove the rule that like when you hit the ball and it goes over the net, that it has to be within the boundaries, everybody would just be hitting it very strong and very far. So any rule you remove, it just breaks the game entirely. Whereas with football, you can go all the way down to just kicking a rock and it's still a fun game. <laughs> um, nice. It's good observation. I completely agree. Football. Basketball is similar in this part um, of the rules that you add and remove. But still, like if you if you grab the ball and you walk with the ball, everybody's gonna be very pissed because you're not allowed to do that. So you break the game. Interesting, interesting. Right, just this layerness of it. I was thinking about this in a you know, if football as a concept was some product that the company that created it wants to to establish in the market, how do you do it? And they'll have to think about acquisition and then about retention and so what we're talking about which involves the take of it like that you just need a ball and nothing else and then also the lack of particular physical requirements all of this is kind of good acquisition right like to acquire new people to to play the game it's easy to acquire them because it's very simple to to have the prerequisites although i was thinking about this worse of football rather than players right i guess one way to make somebody a fan of watching football is for them to have played football as a kid. Probably that's the usual way it happens. But yeah, I just want to mention this acquisition versus retention model when we compare sports, right? Because acquisition for playing football is very simple. Acquisition for playing, I don't know, horse riding is exceptionally hard. You need a horse. Come on. (laughs) Uh, Now, I have those negative points I want to say about about the acquisition and about the retention. They're no negative points. <laughs> <They're> no... <laughs> now, a big downside of football. and So it's 90 minutes. For example, yesterday it got extended to even 120. It's two straight hours. There were breaks without time. It's even more. And um, for the most part, if you're not like a really keen observer, like if you're not some super... You're just kind of casually watching and not that much is happening, right? That's what, for the most part, usually, it's not a constant scoring of points like basketball or even American football. Like, there's a pretty big chance for a game to finish 0-0 or nil-nil, I think it's called, right? And that is the least exciting thing I've ever heard. And again, the acquisition, but yeah, actually, this is acquisition of fans. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine a while back about this precise thing and like why European football was not that popular in America, especially back then. Now it's kind of making a a comeback, let's say. And the point he made is that American sports and kind of American culture, you know, it's about this quick satisfaction generally, but also there's this whole culture of, oh, I'm going to take my family to a sports event this Saturday or Sunday and we'll go to a baseball game and it's this many hour activity and we're gonna do a sports event this Saturday or Sunday. And I don't know, we'll go to a baseball game and it's this many hour activity and we're gonna drink and eat there and observe and it's gonna be exciting and great and I'm gonna pay like $500 more for, for this activity, probably more. Now imagine this whole thing, you plan this whole weekend to take the kids go to the stadium, watch the match, the whole excitement, and then the game finishes nil, nil. I would never watch football again. You know, yeah, you, you know what I mean. So that's a big issue that it's quite possible that nothing happens in the end, which if you're an actual fan, if you really care about the game, yeah, understand how it's still a pretty interesting and valid thing. But for 
less rigorous fans. That seems like a like a terrible deal. Watching ninety minutes for a nil nil, no man. Well, I beg to differ. Nil nil can be amazing. Fun <laughs> it quite well. So the same goes for basketball, but with tennis, man, with you can't watch a tennis game. You can't a, a lot time for tennis because you, it could be one hour, it could be four hours. Come on, who has four hours during the day to watch a tennis game? It's the posh sport, right? Posh people can do it. But <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm not even joking, right? Well, with football, I know exactly when it starts and I know exactly when it ends. It's a bit different with international tournaments because you have these this extra time penalties and so on but in general it's a very fixed amount of time now regarding the nil nil i have actually read some research back in the day maybe five ten years ago about this and it goes like this goals in football are quite rare it's a rare event so this makes it very quite rare it's a rare event so this makes it very rewarding it makes it much much more rewarding right than with basketball so if i could be a bit naughty and uh say like if you're having some sexual interaction same goes for it right the the longer you wait for the reward the better it is i i can imagine that fans have this feeling about football this orgasmic feeling when somebody scores or this negative orgasm when the other part scores, right? Uh, so this makes it much more exciting for them because they had to wait for, for the moment. But on top of this, you're the best man of Vaini. So I've been watching some games with Vaini and actually he comes to my place. We drink some beers, we talk a bit. We're not even watching the game, right? So it's in the background, nobody... We're not even watching the game, right? So it's in the background. Nobody's paying attention. Whenever the commentary is like, whoa, 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 and we're like, oh, something is happening. But football is not breaking our interaction at all. If we were to watch basketball or volleyball, every point matters, man. And we're just mm. there and we're simply watching the game. We're not talking. We're not doing anything. We're just passionate about the game. So maybe this new newness of football is not a bad thing per se you can do other stuff you can eat you can converse you can work even i guess while watching football while you can't do the same with other sports hmm. yeah it's a good point it's kind of a how do i see like you can easily socialize while, while watching football mm. okay yeah but then that's a like it's a downside for going to the stadium upside for watching it from home let's say or from the pub or somewhere yeah even the pub that's amazing because Somebody like does something something stupid and everybody's like, oh, you're so stupid. You can't play football for shit and stuff like that. And I guess this, this socialness of it makes it makes it fun, even when it's a boring mm. thing. And then actually what you were saying about, oh, okay, we circled back to the, the point of the, the feeling passion for the game. So those quick gratification games like, like basketball or even tennis as well, like there's a point being scored every so often, like very often. Uh, and so it's not such a big deal, right? Whereas with football, you wait a lot, which, as you said, increases the value of a goal or, or a nearly missed goal when it actually happens. So maybe that's why people get like so worked up and like thrash some stuff, break some stuff. Because imagine a buildup of, of 75 minutes just for some guy to, to miss a penalty and you get super angry. If there was minutes just for some guy to, to miss a penalty and you get super angry. If there was points every one minute on average and somebody misses something, whatever. Like, I mean, you could feel bad about it and stuff, but you're not going to be enraged. But if you've been building it up for an hour, that's actually okay. Now I appreciate the point much more that um, you build up this emotional outpour and you don't know if it's going to be a negative or positive one. I just remembered the scientific paper I started quoting. So it was this thing, this idea that the more time you wait for the special event, the special goal or point or whatever, the higher the gratification. And now there could be another thing, another layer on top of this. So if you score early in the game, 
it counts for less than if you score later during the game. You know, there are these questionnaires and stuff with different rounds. So first round is for one point. Second round is for, round is for two points. Third round is for three points. So taking this idea and placing it into the uh, sport, this scientific paper was arguing that this would have the biggest gripness of the fans over the game. So somebody's winning in the beginning, but like if you're if we have been leading all the ga- uh, all game long with one nil, if you if you go to one one, the second team to score wins the game, right? So this this has this increased tension in the whole game. You never have the um, a tie unless it's nil nil, right? Once you break the, the tie, you can never have a tie in this game, making it much more interesting. I mean, you could you could still have a tie, but yeah. <laughs> No, 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 no. So they, what they were saying is, if you have one one, the the per, the team that scored later wins the game because their goal weighs more. Oh, but like this was actually the way it it worked. Yeah, yeah. So the the paper was looking for ways to make sports more interesting. I see, I see, I see. And this was one of the points. So this would make a game much more interesting. But then another thing they said is the event should be much harder than to score a goal in football. It's kind of like the, the whole thing with catching the snitch in, in Harry Potter, you know? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, kind of like that, catching the snitch. J.K. Rowling must have read this paper, building the fantasy <laughs> sport. I can't believe they called a snitch. Just, why are they call it a snitch? <laughs> so this is one of the things I had written down before starting the podcast to, to ask, right? Because... How did we two get or not get into football? And when I asked myself this question, I realized that I have a particular story. So, you know, as a kid, just in the neighborhood, yeah, I would play football in the neighborhood. Yeah, I would play football and stuff. And yeah, I would enjoy it, sure, just like any kid probably. And then I must have been quite young. I don't remember exactly how much, how, how old. And um, there was this match on TV and watched with my grandpa, who watched a lot of football. And it was this amazing match, Milan versus Liverpool, 2005, I believe. And like, it was 2-0 for Milan, and then Liverpool came back from 2-0 to equalize, and then they won with penalties or something. It was amazing, and like, it was the best. You know, it's everything that the match could give you. There were a lot of plot twists, and like comebacks, and a, a unified squad against the like the kind of the Goliath versus um oh god I forgot the name um David David that's it David versus Goliath team it was the best match anybody can ever hope for I think I think it was even a final for something Milan then three three in the regular time they went to extra time then Liverpool won with penalties Champions League two thousand and five final. Literally all the stars aligned. It was the final of the Champions League, 3-0, a comeback happens. It, it's amazing, right? And I was watching this match. I'm a kid. I'm like 10 years old or something. I'm watching with my grandpa. We're spending time together. It's amazing. The whole thing is the best it can ever be. And it didn't really want to, uh, it didn't make me really want to go on watching football, right? So at this point I knew okay, football is like a, a closed door for me because if this amazing experience didn't make me want to go and watch football on my own and research players or do whatever, I'll never be into football. So this was the make or break point for me. I watched the best match that wow. has ever happened in my lifetime and it didn't make me want to go out of my way to, to, to watch football. So this was the make or break point for me. I watched the best match that wow. has ever happened in my lifetime and it didn't make me want to go out of my way to, to, to watch football. So that's the story of how I did not get into football, right? <laughs> Which is weird because it's by watching the best match ever. What about you? It was the best match ever. And this is the first game I actually remember in my life, right? And uh, I've spoken about this with several different people our age. And most of them seem to remember this game because it was so, so cool. That day I became a fan of Liverpool forever. I don't dislike Milan, but I don't know, Liverpool won. So for me, it was the better team. 
I don't know, I was watching it for some time, in some occasions, I was watching football, but I was, I never thought about what you said, that this was the make it or break it moment. National games where clubs from different countries go against each other, and I've always thought, I'm alright with watching a game every now and, now and then. I don't really do it, but but this was... This make it or break it moment for you was the moment I became a fan of, fan of Liverpool. And I know many people that got so excited about that game, at this very game, that they became football fans forever. I don't know. You're just different. You're just different. You're just a tennis guy. I'm just a tennis guy. There was this tiny detail that I noticed in your story that you were actually watching this game with your grandfather. And actually, this was one of my points about um, acquisition of fan base. And usually it's always your father or your grandfather or your uncle that showed you this game and said, hey, come with me, we're going to watch this football fun that day with your relative. Quite often, you inherit the team that your relative likes. So your father is a fan of Liverpool, you become a fan of Liverpool or your grandfather is a fan of Man United and you become one too. And this is quite in- interesting for me because th- there is this inheritance of allegiance to a team. Many people get very excited about this and they follow in the steps of their fathers and grandfathers. No, but it's very true because, yeah, like the only times I've watched any kind of sport and really gotten into it kind of emotionally is when I pick a team and then I really kind of know stuff. Many people get very excited about this and they follow in the steps of their fathers and grandfathers. No, but it's very true because, yeah, like the only times I've watched any kind of sport and really gotten into it kind of emotionally is when I pick a team and then I really kind of know stuff about them and I, I follow them kind of as, as people, so not just as a, as a team. And you know the history of it, you know what's changed, that, that's what really gets you into it. So for me, maybe that's it. Yeah, I just never yeah, had a team to really root for but while speaking about this that you know me being 10 years old and my grandpa being uh, old at the time could watch the same thing and enjoy it and me not knowing anything about football him being very good at football having played semi-professionally is the simplicity of watching football right so we talked about how simple it is to to get into playing football it's the same about watching it because it's sort of clear enough what's going on happening. Like at some point, I realized, oh, I shouldn't just be like a, like a, you know, a cat chasing a laser, just look watching the ball and not understanding the bigger picture. I started zooming out and watching, of, uh, watching like the whole page and all the players and how you know the the lines move. Like say the defense line of four defenders, how they move together is like a wave and oh, there's strategy that's amazing and all of those realizations. So there's this depth, this richness in the game. But the important point is just like playing it, that if you strip all of this complexity away, the bare, the bare bones underneath is, is just a bunch of guys kicking a ball into a rectangle. And it still is fun to watch, right? That's the amazing part. You don't need to understand the complexity to enjoy it. Because, for example, think about this. You're watching, I don't know, my most recent example is Formula One, F1. Watching it with somebody and... It's not that easy to understand what's going on. Watching it with somebody and... It's not that easy to understand what's going on. Because, for example, pit stops and then this one driver appears to be, you know, second. But in reality, they're like 15th, but they haven't pit stopped yet. Then there's like this whole confusion with it. and It's not very easy to observe what is going on. Um, and this whole strategy with when to change the tires. Oh, but soft or like hard tires and... It's very complex to, to just keep track of who's actually winning even. Whereas in football, oh, they're winning, it's 2-0. Okay, cool. It's different with Formula 1, I guess, the beauty they see in the sport is that the rules are ever-changing and you have to learn the new rules and how the new things mesh with the game. So it's actually like made-up rules <laughs> to make it more complex. <laughs> Uh, the opposite of football that's why why f1 is a great retention thing initially that many people just just Mm. drop off whereas football you can probably go exceptionally deep in understanding it 
but you can also enjoy it right away. Yeah, makes sense. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a product that you open the box and it, you don't need the manual. You don't need to read the manual to 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 get it started. <laughs> I kind of know of a product like that. <laughs> I, I'm not gonna plug it. I'm not gonna plug it. You just check check the bio, check the <laughs> check the course notes. <laughs> uh. <sighs> I've been thinking about this issue years, years ago. Why do people watch football? And my simple observation was that people want to be a part of something that wins. They want to root for something. They want to be in a group of people that is a winner, that is getting trophies, that is winning games, getting trophies, that is winning games. And this makes people feel much better overall. Not everybody can be a professional football player or very good at, I don't know, programming or something. But everybody can have a football team that wins, right? So this is something... It's like pride and sense of achievement by association. Exactly. Yeah. It's sense of achievement by association. It's very easy to become a Liverpool fan after winning against Milan in 2005, right? But what makes you an actual fan, as they say, is that you go through the adversities and then you start losing because no one team wins all the time. Some years they win, some years they lose, some games they win, some other games they lose. And there's this adversity and you start like acquiring not only the the pride of achievement, but also the pain. Acquiring not only... The, the pride of achievement, but also the pain of the loss, right? And you become much more intertwined with this team. And you're like, oh, we've been together through the good times, but we've also been together in, in the bad times. And I'm a real fan and I have the privilege and I have the right to be happy when they win because I was sad when they lost, right? On the point of retention that you are bringing up, This is a very good point for retention. If you've suffered and you've won, then you're with this team together forever in your mind. But it feels like this would be true for virtually any sport, right? Like it's not football related. Indeed. So that was my point. So this is what I would tell people. Like I I tell this story and they're like, oh yes, I'm so convinced. And I'm like, yeah, but this is with every sport ever, right? This is with everything ever. And, And they're like, hmm. And... One point, women that watch football, there are women that play football. However, most of of the time, most of the people that uh, like football, enjoy football, are male. Now, getting these two points together, what are the places where there is camaraderie of men doing stuff together? And it's the army, right? So there is something very military about these crowds of people getting together to root for something to to scream to shout to to jump together to hit each other right so it's something very primitive that comes out football and i guess american football included here uh, gets gets these men very riled up about something and they can be super aggressive towards the other team. They can shout and they can swear and they can throw. Football, and I guess American football included here, uh, is men very riled up about something. And they can be super aggressive towards the other team. They can shout and they can swear and they can throw objects at the other team uh, during the game and they, they hate the other team and everything. And then when the game is over, they go and drink beer together, right? <laughs> and they talk about politics and they, they're friends again. But during that, these 90 minutes, they're at war with each other. So there's this very primal instinct to, to be a part of this war against the others that, that, I, that I think helps football a lot with the fan base, with the fanship. Yeah, yeah, but then again, that's that that's just true about any sport, man. With the you know, it's a okay, not not every sport, but like every you know one v one type of thing where it's two entities, two teams or two individuals fighting against each other. In any way, it's it's kind of 
uh, I don't know, cricket, all of those are one entity versus another entity, 1v1. And then you can feel this really, yeah, it's a battle and you identify with other sides. It's kind of like those, you know, two armies meet and, and each army chooses a champion and then just the two champions fight. And, and if you happen to be the winning side, you're happy because A, you won't, B, you didn't die. So I guess it's a, <laughs> like if there's the primitive connection there, the primal connection, it could be this. What you're saying can be summarized as the longer you've been a fan, the higher chance that you remain a fan because you've been through the good times to the bad times. And it's not something that exhausts itself is the opposite. The more you've been involved, the more you stay involved, which is amazing. It's uh, for retention. It's, that's the best thing that can happen to retention. Once you get somebody hooked, they, they will probably never really leave. Something about retention again that I wanted to say, the actual game, kind of the mechanics of the actual game, is the randomness. And that's something I've thought, I've thought about in a different aspect, about different sports, but now I guess we'll talk about football primarily, is the inherent randomness of it. So, for example... You know, imagine two teams or two players are going to play a game, uh, some game against each other. And if the game is, oh, let's just, um, let's throw a die, let's roll a die, and whoever guesses the number first wins, that's a stupid game because it's fully random. You can never be consistently good at it, right? So one team in some championship can never have a very long winning streak because it's just random. If it's too deterministic, then the game gets dominated by this one person forever. Again, like in F1, Lewis Hamilton has been absolutely dominating it for seven or whatever years. And this is the first year he's been dethroned. Again, like in F1, Lewis Hamilton has been absolutely dominating it for seven or whatever years. And this is the first year he's been dethroned so far by Max Verstappen, as you say, or Max Verstappen, as I say. I don't know which one is correct. Who should totally, you know, mention us and at us, whatever. Mark Verstappen. Uh, Verstappen. Let's just change it one, one more step every time. Ah, Verstappen. Moix. Moix Verstappen. I can't even butcher it anymore. I hope he's yeah. publicly pissed. You know, oh, you guys butchered my name. I'm just called Michael Perstrollen. <laughs> oh. Michael, come here. Oh, oh Fico. <laughs> Fico. Oh, poor, <laughs> poor old, poor old Luis Figo. <laughs> game and how, yeah, if the game is too random, uh, it's kind of stupid because exactly you can't identify with, with one team and like go through the good times, the bad times. It's just random. If it's too deterministic like this, you just go and you know that Hamilton is probably going to win and it's just super deterministic. And there needs to be super careful balance that it, it, it's not quite that random. So it's kill matters and you can have a long successful streak if you're really good at what you do. But it's random enough that some David can always kill some Goliath, right? And I think football really nails this. It's not that uncommon that the game finishes one nil let's say um and you know you play for 90 minutes it's very hard to organize an attack that actually scores a goal because there's the goalkeeper at the goal it, it's pretty hard to score a goal right and it happens that sometimes a team that's supposedly much weaker just randomly gets one in and then the best team has yeah amazing but they just can't score and i think this level of randomness is a really sweet spot for the randomness of the game like you know that even if it's an amazing team playing some third tier team there's always a chance a real fighting chance uh and nothing you just don't know while at the same time if you take like statistics over a long run you can definitely tell who's better and who's not and and this is a very very strong point i think for for watching football that you just don't know what's going to happen i guess still the same applies to quite a few sports it's not very unique to football but i don't watch enough of the other sports either <laughs> to really know. they changed the rules recently uh, due to COVID and uh, stuff that came with it some players got COVID and it has longer lasting effects these things so they decided to change the rules so now instead of having three substitutes that came with it 
some players got COVID and it has longer lasting effects, these things. So they decided to change the rules. So now instead of having three substitutes, you can have five substitutes. I was wondering about that. They kept changing people and I thought maybe it's because it's like extended time. There's some extra or something, but they kept changing people. If there is extra time, you get one more sub. So a total of six subs. Now, this is very controversial. Like the whole football community is like divided. Some people love it. Some people hate it. Some people are like, oh no, you're breaking the beauty of the game by allowing more subs or whatever that means. So I'm very, very strongly in favor of more subs. Okay, that, that's probably a bit off topic, but that's just the way I think about it. Something that I've recently discovered about, which we'll talk about in a different episode, but what I mean is that you have those same entities, right, say the two teams, that they themselves don't change, and they repeat the same motions over and over again, but with slight variation, right, many times. And this holds very much the depth of those games that are maybe on round-based, what I mean is the following. You, you you start, you know, imagine you're your team and you start the game against another team. And initially it's like a blank canvas. And then, you know, to just some casual observer, they just kick the ball around. But no, they have strategies, they've planned. And so they try this strategy, that strategy. And in a single game, I don't know how many attacks there are, but probably, you know, one, one attack per minute on average, one attack per couple of minutes. So there's many attacks, like between 50 and 100, let's say, attacks per game. Uh, and so you start building up, right? Like you, you start from blank and then you try per game. Uh, and so you start building up, right? Like you, you start from blank and then you try strategies one through five that you've prepared. You try one attack of each, you know, one long ball, one shorter ball. You kind of try what works, what doesn't work. And then you start noticing cracks in the other team's defense. Oh, you know, it seems that on this particular day, on this particular pitch, against this particular enemy... Enemy. Enemy. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> what a phrasing. Um, it seems that, I don't know, going with this strategy... Going with strategy number two seems to work a bit better. So kind of start pushing a bit more towards this strategy, doing variations of this strategy, etc. So what I mean is that I really like this concept of, of games that have many repetitions of a similar motion that within the actual game, the team needs to evolve, right? At least it needs to learn. It needs to evolve as requested by the environment. I've only recently started seeing it with, from this perspective that it's not this random thing that, oh, it finally happened and they kept doing the exact same thing. No, they've been, they started from somewhere and then it's a kind of a random walk, random walk re- exploration of, of what kind of strategy could work, where's the the crack in the other team's defense. And it's, a, it's an exploration, kind of blind exploration in some state space of, of immense complexity. So, having said this, which is probably absolutely unnecessarily complex, just like this podcast, uh, but that's how I see it for real. Having said this, having more subs kind of breaks this. Because, you know, you... The two teams play against each other for an hour. This amount of learning what works and what doesn't today against this team has learned some um, some level and, and you have some really good idea by now of, of each other as opponents. And, and you have some really good idea by now of, of each other as opponents. And then, well, they, they do two subs and suddenly it's a whole new team and you start from minute zero. So that's why... I would probably be kind of in favor of as few changes as possible. But obviously there's different considerations. There's the players' health, you know, somebody gets injured, somebody's tired, etc. So obviously there's a necessity for changes, but I would generally try to keep them on the lower side because of this. For me, the beauty of the game is the on-site exploration of, um, of each other's opponents. Sounds like you've only been watching the Italian national team playing yeah they have a very attacking style so if you see the defense of the italian team it's almost like like in the other f- side of the field so they're constantly trying new stuff trying to this trying that 
But many teams are not doing constantly trying new stuff, trying to this, trying that. But many teams are not doing this, man. Many teams are just like, like I have this strategy and it's a counter strategy of the other guy's strategy. Now, where is the problem in your thing? You are assuming that the same players would be trying the same thing until they find the crack. But the subs in reality had only one purpose and it was I, I use this sub because I have a very short player in my attack and I need um, a taller player so I can explore much much more variations of this because now I have a tall player and he can play with his head so I can cross and he's like bigger so he can push people around and so on so it's actually helping your point having more players Having more subs uh, for for two teams to really get to to, to know each other um, in this particular day and time. If you change the team entirely a couple of times throughout the game, then it becomes too random. That, that's the balance of randomness, right? So you can't build up knowledge if your subjects, the subject of your learning, keep keeps changing. Uh, so yeah, it increases the complexity, but then for me. It seems to become just just too complex, too random. You can't because it's not just about the team strategy. It's about those individual one v one battles. You know, for example, there's this amazing scoring player like uh, Messi, and then they have against you, and then you've assigned your best defense player to to tag Messi and just don't let him breathe. And this is not like the team strategy. Now it's between them two. Them two have had so many. I don't know, interactions throughout this game that now they know between themselves how each one approaches the crossing throughout this game that now they know between themselves how each one approaches the crossing the other one I don't know the terms but you know what I mean like when they encounter each other only once they've encountered each other a hundred times in a very short amount of, of time that it becomes interesting it, it's mind games between them too and when this happens between all sorts of pairs of players between two teams and then on the bigger scale of like you know the whole midline versus the whole other midline and then on the scale of the whole team that's when it gets really beautiful and um uh evolved right and if you keep changing them this can happen it's just you it devolve back to just it's a new match it's a new match just do the default strategies if you look at football strategies <laughs> a bit more you realize that they actually do this on purpose they change the wings all the time they change their places sometimes the 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 back the defender on the left for instance goes goes in attack so that for instance goes goes in attack so that they can change this pair and they're actually mm. doing it all the time just to confuse the enemy and it's a very big part of the game especially recently in the final that you watched yesterday actually both goals by England and by Italy were scored by a defender because they were doing the strategy which is they go in attack to confuse the defense and stuff like that so maybe maybe that was true what you're saying was true some time ago but right now everybody is trying to be as surprising as possible to, to the other team and yeah I don't know man Messi can beat anyone 1v1. And uh, that's why they place two guys on him. But at what cost? Well, sometimes it costs Barcelona the game. Blood all the time because it makes the, the game much more dynamic. And you can see that after 60 minutes, 70 minutes of play, they stop running. They're just tired. They can't run so fast. And then if you can change five players or six players as with, with the new rules for the extra time, you're basically changing more than half of the team. And they have new power, new attacks, new strategies, and the game becomes much more interesting. Because until now, you know that with these three subs, you can't really give fresh blood to the team. You're giving one player, but that's that. Well, that's kind of the... the um philosophical question of you know what what makes it the same and at what point has this team changed to become a new team like how, how much of it can you change before it's new so i'll give you this theoretical question supposition imagine 
well that's kind of the the um, philosophical question of you know what what makes it the same and at what point has this team changed to become a new team like how, how much of it can you change before it's new so i'll give you this theoretical question supposition imagine boxing right but heavyweight boxing where especially if it goes to many rounds uh, they get very tired they can barely move they can barely keep their arms up if like i don't know like seven eight nine rounds of, of heavyweight professional boxing so it's a real issue there right like they really get tired and you can tell but it's a 1v1 so what do you think about this sport which is team boxing so at any given moment there's only one boxer of each team in the ring but in the team there's let's say five boxers so at any point you can just sub out and sub out and sub out so you get to to to, to see many pairs fight between the two teams <laughs> well i think wwe the wrestling wrestlemania stuff i think that's what they're doing exactly like you just like they, they they beat the crap out of somebody and he's like with his oh like like he's almost dying but he reaches the end of the um uh, the corner of of the, um, the place where they fight and then he hits the hand of the other team and then he comes and he just crushes the other guy and then the same happens again and again and again and like five people change i think that's that's what they do yeah but now imagine it happening for real <laughs> well it does happen for real the the real injury is happening don't do this at home children so yeah i don't know i think it it, it makes things more exciting but less strategic let's put it this way oh i think it's quite strategic yeah but but then he will substitute just to next level the game and then he lost anyways he did it twice in the tournament and I, I don't know what he was thinking but but it was just ridiculous uh maybe like you he didn't want to use the substitutes and he was like i want to change this but i want, don't want to change it too much because otherwise it's going to be so different that nobody is going to know their, their, their place in the game. Maybe. Maybe that was it. Only he knows. They don't want to make it too hard for people to understand the game. So, having said all of this, is football the greatest game ever? What do you think? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my, my impression from the conversation is that... Feels like many of the very good strong points that we've we've discovered are kind of universally sports applicable, but I would still still think the fact that at any level of simplifying it, it still makes sense, even kicking a rock on the street. Wow. Inspiring, right? Go kick wow. some rocks on the street, kids. <laughs>